glad that you can be joining us today on our sound discussion about Psalm 91 in this time of troubled times during COVID-19. Yes, we've gathered today, it's Sunday uh, evening, and we're going to read with you Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And I'm going to jump down to verse 9 and 10. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall befall, be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent. We've been talking about the sound for quite a few days around our table, and we've been talking about dwelling places because, well, it's COVID-19 and we're kind of quarantined inside our homes and so this seemed like just such a fitting sound because it talks about a dwelling place and a place of it, it says a shelter it talks about abiding it talks about a refuge and a fortress these are all things that um, provide um, shelter and so we've been talking about uh, what is a dwelling place what what does it mean well we, a dwelling place is the place where you dwell, where you live, where you find rest for your body, where you put your legs up and, and where you talk with one another, where we fellowship together, where we get nourishment, where we eat and drink together. And so now it, the psalm says that he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And then later on in verse 9 it says, Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place. So this is very amazing that God to us is the place that we can find shelter and rest and fellowship and nourishment. I just think that's such a beautiful thought that He is the one that we have to find ourselves um, to abide under and in. Yeah, I'm surprised how, you know, you've added to what it all is meant by dwelling in God. Like when I think of dwelling in God as our refuge, I think right away, well, it's a place of security and protection. But you're saying there's more to the story. That you dwell in home not only for security and protection, but because you also have food and nourishment. It's a place also of family, love, and communion. And so a home and a dwelling place is is more than just a place for, for safety and protection, is it? I think it could mean that whatever we're doing, our whole life is to be focused towards God, everything in our lives. Mm -hmm. So in other words, as we live by faith constantly, we are sheltering ourselves in God, and we are saying, God, you are our fortress, no matter what sort of issues are raging around us, whether COVID-19 is raging around us, we are in Him safe. Right? We can't rely on sheltering in our homes or um, isolating ourselves from other people to protect ourselves. It's Do we have enough social distance refuge. between us here at this table? I'm not sure. <laughs> so I think some of the ways that we can shelter ourselves in God is to um, fellowship with Him. So to pray to Him mm -hmm. and to talk to Him and ask Him to be this security that he promises us in this verse. And now, now in verse one it says, Abel, can you tell us maybe what kind of Hebrew approach to, to this, to writing this is where it says, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. It's Hebrew poetry, so it's where it says the exact same thing in a little different wording, but the same thing twice. That's right. So the Hebrews didn't try to rhyme things. Instead, they would say the same thing twice. So what are the what are the what are the two things, or what what is the one thing he's saying twice here, and what are the two different means in which he's saying that same thing? We dwell in the Most High. So that's what he's saying. And we abide. So the dwelling and the abiding, mm -hmm. and then the Most High is like the highest, right? You're you're sheltering yourself or dwelling in the in the highest one to dwell in. And then he's also the Almighty, the the one who has all might. So mm -hmm. 
Yes. And in the two parts of the verse, you have a shelter and a shadow. So what's a shelter and then what's a shadow? Well, shelter is some place where you can take refuge. Like there's bomb shelters. Okay. If there's a bomb, you yeah. can take shelter and you will be safe from it. And then a shadow is just, you can make shadows. But why do you need a shadow? Why do you want to abide in the shadow of the Almighty? Because he's over you like a mountain. He's over and by you. He protects you from the hot sun is the picture. Yeah, just like our French Bulldogs have a rough time being outside in the hot sun. So we talked about how maybe we need to build something so that they can be shaded from the heat. And so God protects us from heat and from mm -hmm. dangers, as it were. Verse 2, there's a different translation. Um, this translation says, I will say to the Lord... Another way to translate this would to be, he will say, so it connects with the beginning of verse 1, he who dwells, and the person who is dwelling with God will say of God, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. So when we have this personal, uh, very personal, my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust, mm -hmm. when we have this personal faith in God, we are dwelling in abiding in him mm -hmm. yeah here we have the first person personal pronoun used repeatedly mm -hmm. and you're right that it, it shows how we each one of us here as we face the things that stress us out or the things that give us fear we each personally need to say to the lord you are my, my refuge, refuge my, my fortress, fortress my, my god, god and whom, whom i trust. trust so you know i can't trust for you kids and you can't trust for me in some sense we we all need to trust personally in the lord and then, of course, we uh, all our worries kind of flee away, don't they? Let's move on to verse 3. I'll read um, from 3 all the way to verse 8. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. So I think this is talking about how God is delivering us from unseen dangers the terror of the night, the arrow, and the pestilence and destruction, those are all things that we can't see or that are hard to see. God delivers us from a snare of the fowler as well. These are all unseen dangers that God protects us from every single day of our lives. Abriel, do you even know what a uh, fowler is and what's the snare of a fowler? It's a person who would catch birds. That's right. So he must have had like a net or something, and, and of course he made it so you couldn't see the net, right? Because yeah. if you could see it, then the bird wouldn't fly into it. Like see for <laughs> Yeah. So he says he's going to deliver you from the snare of the fowler. So there is, there is a snare of a fowler. There are these unforeseen And we've been things. caught in it. We can't be delivered from something we haven't fallen into. So this means that we have fallen into this snare for is it him to deliver sense? it. Us from it. Is it picturing sin? Probably not here. It's more something, you know, what a follower tries to do when he catches the bird is he kills it probably mm -hmm. to eat. And so here, now the question is, does God just deliver us from the snare of the follower? And one way is that he keeps us from even being caught. Now if, if the pictures of being caught in a snare, then of course it's true, then the idea could be that God also delivers us from the snare too. Now I have an a interesting uh, example of this. My dad had a friend who, when he was in graduate school, didn't have any money. He actually lived in a garage, and his only heat he got was from a wood stove. Well, he didn't have enough to eat, so what he did is, he, he was a very inventive person though, and he made a snare, and there was a bunch of geese that were by a nearby pond. So he put these snares out, and he put a piece of popcorn in the middle, and when a goose would a Canadian goose would stick his head through and grab the popcorn. When he'd pull it back, he'd get his neck caught in the snare. And then later on in the day, this guy would come and he'd there the thing would be squawked in and stuff like that. And he'd catch it, take it home, and he'd butcher it and he'd cook it right on top of his wood stove. 
Well, then he had a problem, though, because some people noticed that someone was doing this, and they'd walk by, and these geese had been caught in there, and they'd be making all the squawking, honking sound. You know, so mad because they got caught, they couldn't get loose. Well, then he devised a new thing where when they put their head through the snare and got the piece of popcorn, when they pulled it back, something also went into their throat, so they couldn't make any noise. And so he kept catching them, and that's, you know, he ate a lot of geese that way. <laughs> so he was a fowler, and he would catch the Canadian geese in his snare. So the point is, is that God also delivers us from danger and from the follower. Now, who, who is the follower, do you think? Who, who could we understand the person who's trying to catch us and kill us as? Satan. Well, I think that would be biblical, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Because Satan does, he's trying to go after our souls. Who else do you think it could refer to? Just the wicked that hate us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are going after us and trying to destroy us. Yeah. I find this part in verse 7 interesting. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. What does that it refer to? It could refer to these wicked people who are coming after us, and it could be one idea is that God is rescuing us from the powers of wickedness which are pursuing us, but another idea is that it could refer to all these um, things mentioned in verses 5 and 6, the terror of the night, the arrow, the pestilence, and the destruction. Um, that these thousand and ten thousand are falling because they do not have God as their refuge to protect them from all these dangers. Yeah, and this is really a startling passage, isn't it? Because what it's saying is that it's like you, you are as a believer. We're standing there, we're fighting the battle of faith. And around us, thousands of people might be perishing and dying, whether it's on a battlefield from arrows flying or whether it's because of pestilence being sent um, as a judgment of God and the wicked here. Um, and here we are, we, we still stand upright, and so it's quite something that God is so protective of his covenant people. Mm -hmm. So, but what, okay, so let's take this to the COVID-19, the pestilence, it says, and from deadly pestilence, but that doesn't mean that we're, we're not going to catch this virus. Like, our whole family could very well, just like another family, get this virus, right? And we could all... We could all die, or we could all end up at least in the hospital on ventilators. I think what it is saying is that God's not going to let even a pestilence take us from him. We're, we're safely abiding in him, then he'll do whatever it takes to keep us there. He, he's not going to, once you're abiding with Christ, you're always abiding with him. You're, he's not going to like kick you out of the dwelling place. You're safe. We're safe in him. and Nothing can separate us from the right. love of God. Paul says mm -hmm. that right in Romans. But what about verses 9 and 10 where it says, Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High is my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. So Doesn't that seem to be saying that? Hey, uh, as a believer, you know, you won't get COVID-19. Just recently, there, there were some ultra-Orthodox Jews in Jerusalem or in Palestine and they said, well, the, the Torah protects us. And so they kept going to synagogue. And the secular Jews were all mad. And now what has happened is that among those ultra-Orthodox groups, the COVID-19 is spreading like crazy. Hmm. We're spiritually secure in Christ. So so you don't think not... this refers to uh, actual hmm. believers, you know, not getting pestilences? Well, well this was certainly true um, in the Old Testament. God protected his people mm -hmm. in wondrous ways think um, of the israelites when they lived in goshen yep they didn't get they didn't get the darkness they didn't get the the frogs they didn't get the certain all plagues. the other ones and mm -hmm. yeah and it's true that during the wilderness moderns god did protect his covenant people mm -hmm. in a marvelous way and i think in the old testament too as his people walked in faithfulness god gave them long life he protected them from their enemies and protected them from pestilences yep. Bless their harvests, you know, their, their wives had many children, their cows had a lot of calves. <laughs> and that, of course, was typical of spiritual blessings in the New Covenant. So yes, in the New Covenant, we can't expect that God will always give us perfect health or great riches or many, many, many children or anything like that. Um, so yeah, there, there is a, in the Old Testament, things were 
typical in a certain sense, pointing towards spiritual reality. But does God protect us today from Well, diseases? just that we're here and we're healthy, right? Like he's protected us today, so we should be giving thanks for at least that. He's but it says no plague shall come near your tent, and we do have sicknesses sometimes. So right. what do you think this could? Well, I notice some of the commentators, too, on this psalm say that it's referring especially to God's judgment on his enemies. So the point is that when God is judging his enemies, God's covenant people in the Old Testament were going to be safe in that context. Like Gabriel mentioned in, in Egypt, how God judged the Egyptians, and yet God's covenant people were protected from certain plagues. And um, so it's possible that that's an emphasis in the psalm here, that, you know, notice how it talks about how there will be a recompense of the wicked in verse 8, and then verse 9 talks about how, on the other hand, as you walk in obedience, then, you know, God will be your refuge and your protector. We, we didn't talk about verse 4, though. Maybe we should talk about that. What's, what's going on when the psalmist says, He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. Well, let's just explain what a pinion is. It's a feather on a bird. Okay. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. That's the final part of verse 4. I remember hearing about a farmer who went out to his barn and the mother chicken she um she had been killed by an animal but underneath her wings all the little babies were still safe under her wings and like this animal had like sucked the blood out of her head or i mean it was just really horrible what the animal had done to her but under her wings all the little chicks were safe and i think I think of that when I read that verse, that we're safe in Christ, in his mm -hmm. abode, in him, in him, we find safety. Yeah, there was, in the National Geographic years ago, there was an article about how a mother bird dies to protect her chicks. And there had been a forest fire in National, a Yellowstone National Park, and a forest ranger found a bird that was literally petrified in ashes. And so he, it was at the base of a tree, and he knocked the bird... And what happened, as soon as he did that, it kind of, I guess, the mother bird fell apart, but all of a sudden, three little chicks ran out from underneath. Hmm. So it's striking how that mother bird, yes, had protected her little chicks from the fire, even. Hmm. But the picture is of who protecting who here? God protecting his chosen children. That's right. Mm -hmm. And so Peter pointed out, too, that there's, there's two different, once again, this is Hebrew poetry. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. That's saying the same thing two different ways. And it says, his faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. What, what is a buckler? Well, I think a buckler is a sort of protective belt that you would strap on. So a shield and a buckler would both be things to stop uh, weapons from penetrating into your skin and hurting hmm. you. So God here is... So how in the world is God's faithfulness like some protective gear? <laughs> well, just like he's protecting us from the arrow. I mean, that's... He's watching over us continually all through our lives, that's preventing his, us from all these... That's faithfulness, you're saying. It's this mm -hmm. ongoing unseen, covenant commitment. From all these unseen mm -hmm. dangers. Mm -hmm. Do you want to read verse 11 through 13 for us, David? Sure. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands, lest they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and a crow brought the lion, the young lion, and a serpent, and you shall trample underfoot. This is the passage which Satan uses to tempt Jesus when mm -hmm. he places or he is placed on the pinnacle of the temple during the forty days of Jesus' temptation. He tempts Jesus to jump off the pinnacle of the temple and quotes this verse, lest for the angels will bury you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. This is the passage in Matthew 4, verses 6. And it, he says, And he shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bury you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. 
So it's not the exact wording that he uses, but pretty similar. It's probably using the Septuagint or something like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, what is, now, what's interesting to me is that when we read this passage, we right away think, oh, this refers to Jesus. So in the context of this psalm, is this only saying that angels will watch over Jesus' feet so he doesn't even stub his toes? Or does it refer more broader to, like, us? I think it refers to all of us. Though, it was um, fulfilled by Jesus in some sense. So especially angels were watching over the Messiah, too. And we, find, we know they ministered to him at critical points mm -hmm. in, the Garden in his of ministry, Gethsemane. too. Yeah, that's right. And so here, notice the marvelous thing that God sends his holy angels in the Old Testament, but also the New Testament, to guard his people. In the Old Testament, he sent angels to destroy Assyrian armies, for example, mm -hmm. right? And he sent his angels to uh, guard his people, to stand up for Israel, like in the book of Daniel, how Michael the archangel, we're told, you know, is someone who especially fights for the people of God. Mm -hmm. So it isn't it great to know that God sends his angels to protect us. Now, why doesn't, if, if, if God is... Why doesn't God just directly protect us? Why does he need to use angels? Why can't the angels all just stay in heaven? He doesn't need to use angels. He just uses them for his glory. Right? That's why all creatures exist. That's right. It's like with us too. God uses the means of humans doing things like sharing the gospel to win other people to Christ. Whereas God could do this without any human agency if he wished. But God sovereignly has chosen to use the agencies of angels to guard Covenant children. That's why the Bible says, remember, that if someone uh, causes one of the little covenant children to stumble, that would be better for him that there was a millstone, you know, wrapped around his foot and he's thrown into the ocean. In, the, in verse 13, in the final part of the section we read, it says, You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. And some people would take this verse to mean that you can actually handle dangerous snakes and things like that. But this could be symbolic of Satan, who in scripture is pictured as a roaring lion and as a snake in um, but Genesis is, 3. But is the text itself here saying that um, we will tread on Satan? It isn't necessarily, but we could look at other metaphors in scripture and see that they align with this. Right. You're not engaged in allegorical exegesis. Hmm. Right. Correct. Because the meaning of the text is just saying that we can actually, um, dangerous beasts will not be able to hurt us, we'll be able to trample underfoot. But you're right. The application also in the Bible is that as Christians, we have victory and conquest over Satan himself. At the end of Romans, Paul talks about how, you know, soon Satan will be under our feet. And he's pictured as, you know, as the great red dragon. And Satan, of course, in the Bible is also pictured as a lion, right? Mm -hmm. And, and yes, it's true that God will uh, give us the victory over him as well. Hmm. Then well, we have the last, look at the last, verses, the last yeah. three verses. I'll read them. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With a long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. It's very interesting. It's got quotations around it. Um, it seems as if it's, it's because it's God talking. Spoken by God, right? And that's encouraging that he says, when we call to God, he's going to answer us and he will be with us in trouble. God himself is saying this and we can trust his Word. He knows our name. Like, how many million people are on the earth? You know, we know how many people by name, but God knows all his people by <laughs> by name. But here it's saying, I will protect him because he knows my name. It's because you know the name of God. See that? Mm -hmm. it's and, what is God's he's name? He's and what is God's true. name? And what is God's name? Well, it was Almighty and Most High and my fortress, mm -hmm. my refuge. And in the Lord. New Testament, our Father, which art in heaven. Mm -hmm. That's the name we are to hallow, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but you're right that we know his name and he knows our names. Mm -hmm. And he knows us individually. And that's why mm -hmm. um, he does these things. 
Now, what's striking here is that it says, because he holds fast to be in love, I will deliver him. Now, what, what, what kind of strikes you about that statement? Well, theologically, we would think it would be more correct to say that God is holding fast to us in love because he first loves us before we can love him. But mm -hmm. here, it's striking that he says that we are holding fast to God in love. But of course, that's a result of his, his love for yeah. us. Yeah. That's right. And but, hold fast is so picturesque, right? Like I think of like skiing or something behind mm -hmm. a boat, you're holding on really tight, right? Or, and are you, you know, doing that? Are, are you doing that? Are you holding fast and clinging to God in love? Oh, that we would love God more, right? Mm -hmm. So when we... So we, yes, we... Uh, now, I think this emphasizes to human, human responsibility comes to the fore. Like Herman Bavik would say, in the covenant, he said, in the covenant relationship, there's a mutuality, you know, a relationship between us and God. And that's being emphasized here, that it's in the way of us holding fast to God in love, loving Him, being committed to Him. In that way, you, you see, we experience God delivering us. We can't say, well, I can walk unrepentantly in sin, and I still expect my God to be there to help me in times of trouble. At the end, it says, with long life, God will satisfy the believer mm -hmm. and show him, I think, the believer his salvation. I think it, it's, he's, he's going to show us this, the marvelous salvation. And he does show us, right, the marvelous way he set mm -hmm. out to save us. And, and all the hymns in there, him, H-I-M, yeah. are thethos in Greek, and then that means God. So these are all the gods, him. I will, with long life, I will satisfy God or Him. Well, I think it's. Theos is the word for God, yeah. and you're thinking of a different word for Him, which is autas in Greek. But we're in the Hebrew Old Testament now, so that's not so relevant. But you're right that there's emphasis on the word Him here. God keeps saying, um, you know, the person who calls on me, I'll help mm -hmm. Him. And He keeps. I'll be with him. There's a repetition. So, I will honor him. I will satisfy him. I'll show him my salvation. So yeah. all the eyes really are God talking. Mm -hmm. We have and this. You could say the him would be the believer. We have this tied all the way back to the beginning, right? It, at, at the beginning it says he. And now it's God talking about the same person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now it says with long life I will satisfy him. What does that mean? Does that mean we can live to be as old as Methuselah? I think that's definitely a picture of eternal life, where we will live forever with him. Mm -hmm. But in the Old Testament, he did give many of his saints yeah. long life, like Moses. In the, in the way of obedience, huh? And Solomon didn't get a long life in the way of disobedience. He died at age 60. All right, Paul, would so, you like to sort of summarize this psalm, what you take away from it? So I think our whole psalm is about, okay, we're, we're supposed to fellowship and rest and trust and, and um, get nourishment from God's word. In, so we're supposed to find this all in him, that he, he's going to be our, um, our refuge and our fortress. He's the one who we're supposed to put our trust in. So we have to stop, in some sense, stop, keep thinking about COVID-19 and put our trust in God. Like, don't let COVID-19 just mm -hmm. keep running through our head, but actually keep letting God's word go in our mind. And we have in our house a few places um, when we're washing our hands that the sound is, is there. And since we have to wash our hands so long, we're trying to memorize it while we're washing our hands because Right? This is what we have to put our trust in. We have a God. Who, not so. Huh? No. We have a God who we can trust in. And, and it's, not, it's not about how good you can wash your hands. It's about God. Everything I'm you do should be. God is. Everything that you do, even when it's when you're, there's a breakout like this, it can all be glorifying God. Even washing your hands. There you go. And yep. brushing your teeth, you can still be not. No. And he's not going to let lasting harm. Nothing lasting is mm -hmm. going to harm us, like spiritually. We're not going to get separated from mm -hmm. him. Well, I think we're out of time. So I think the takeaway we can take from this is that we are secure under the shadow of God's providence. So mm -hmm. Christian, believer, 
you are safe and secure, even in times that are very strange. Goodbye.